The beautiful thing about absolute positioning for us visual designers is that we get to drag things around and position them in a super freeform way, just like working in the design tools we know and love. But when it comes to building well-structured, responsive websites, there's a bit more to it. So let's take a deeper look at the ins and outs of absolute positioning, what it can do for us, and when it makes the most sense to use. Since this is the first of several lessons on layer positioning, I wanna start with an extreme simplification of the four layer position types. We have absolute, where we can freely position layers in relation to their parent frame. Relative, where the position is determined by the flow of content in a stack or grid. Fixed, where the position of a layer is fixed relative to the viewport. And sticky, where a layer switches from relative to fixed when it hits the top of the viewport then back to relative when it hits the bottom of its parent frame. I know that's already a lot to take in, but none of it needs to make sense just yet. We're going to start slow and focus on absolute positioning for this lesson. You can think of absolute position layers as floating in the sense that we can move them around with complete disregard for other sibling layers and just focus on where the layer is in relation to its parent frame. Just like Figma and Sketch, it's our default when creating new projects and pages. So you'll feel right at home. The one thing that may differ slightly from screen design tools is how we define the position of these layers. Rather than the layer having just an X and Y position that's always measured from the top left corner, like Sketch and Figma, Framer gives us a super intuitive combination of pinning and describing position, which is how things work on the web with HTML and CSS. Let's take a look at how it works with a super simplified example. Here I have this long black frame with an absolute position near the top of this desktop breakpoint, which is the parent element it's positioned within. Before we even look at the properties panel, let's get philosophical for a moment. There are a few different ways that a human being could describe the position of this frame. You could say it's horizontally centered. You could say it's 20 pixels from the left, or you could say it's 20 pixels from the right, or both. You could say it's 20 pixels from the top, or you could say it's 500 pixels from the bottom. All of these things are true, but not all of these facts are equally important. For example, who cares that this is 500 pixels from the bottom? It just so happens to be 500 pixels from the bottom, but that doesn't mean it's a deliberate design decision. So let's look at the properties panel. Here we can see all those values describing how far the top of the layer is from the top of its parent frame, how far the left is from the left, the right is from the right, and the bottom is from the bottom. You'll notice some of these values are solid, and some are grayed out. A solid value means a value that's explicitly set, which also means it's a relationship with the parent frame that we want to maintain. In this case, we're saying that this 20 pixels is no accident. We want the top of this frame to be 20 pixels from the top of the parent frame now, and if the parent changes size. In other words, pinning a side means we want to maintain a fixed amount of space, where having a side unpinned means we don't mind if that space changes. This is that combination of pinning and setting position that I mentioned a moment ago. We can pin a side by either explicitly setting a value or by clicking the pinning controls to toggle them. Clicking on the middle will also toggle between pinning all four sides or none of them, which will position relative to the center. I'll go back to pinning just the top. But for the sides, we actually have an important decision to make here. If we leave both sides unpinned, the rectangle will stay centered, sure. But since the rectangle has a fixed pixel width, it'll stay the same width as the parent changes size. Sometimes that is what we want, but for the sake of comparison, let's pin those 20 pixel values. And now we can see that the rectangle maintains those pixel margins by getting stretched and squashed by the parent frame automatically. Another thing worth noting is that pinning doesn't only affect what happens when the parent frame changes size, but also if we change the size of a child layer on the properties panel. For example, I'll pin the rectangle to the top right, then change the width of the rectangle to 100 pixels. That explicit 20 pixel gap to the right edge is maintained, so I don't need to worry about resizing, then repositioning in two separate steps. It's important to note that the choices we make here affect how things move and resize on the design canvas as well as in the browser on the published site. So making good choices is also a stride toward making our sites properly responsive. In the next lesson, we're going to dive into stacks and relative positioning. 
But in case you've already come across a stack, I want you to be prepared for how they behave when absolute positioned layers get mixed in. In this example, I have a frame with a vertical stack layout, which means each of the child layers set to relative positioning will follow the flow of the stack. So dragging simply rearranges the layers within the flow. I'm not free to position things the way I was with absolute positioning. But just because a layer like this graphic is a child of a stack doesn't mean I can't head over to the properties panel and switch it from relative to absolute. You'll notice things collapsed a bit here on the canvas. So what just happened? Well, switching a layer from relative positioning to absolute positioning effectively removes it from the flow of the stack. It's still a child of the stack frame, but its sibling layers, still set to relative, only push against one another, ignoring absolute position layers. And just as we'd hoped, we can now drag our absolute layer to position it wherever we'd like. You'll also notice that this layer is visually overlapping its siblings, but on the layers panel, it's actually not the layer on top. So what the heck? It's because of a style property called Z index that was added automatically when we made the switch from relative to absolute positioning a moment ago. Using Z index, we can pull things forward on top of everything else or push things back behind everything else, regardless of where it happens to be in the layer hierarchy. The higher the number, the further forward, the lower the number, the further backward. And for layers that share the same Z index, the layer hierarchy will determine which is above and what's below, like usual. The default Z index for layers is zero, which means a Z index of one already puts this graphic above everything, zero puts it on the same plane, and negative one puts it back behind everything. You might be thinking, I didn't ask for Z index to get involved here, but it's worth noting that with stacks, the layer order first and foremost determines the flow of the content. So thanks to the Z index property, we can separately control how things overlap. All right, this was a big one, a really big one. We're finally unpacking the fundamental layout mechanics that make Framer so powerful. This stuff is easy to fiddle with, but it does take time to master. Watch this video a few times and go easy on yourself when you make mistakes along the way. I'll see you in the next one.